why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and our first speaker will be Sarah Yanke White, uh, who's a uh, you know, faculty in nursing at UNM Gallup. Um, Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Dr. Stanley. I'm going to also keep track of my time because I don't want to exploit this. Um, um, <laughs> I know we have a limited amount of time, so I'm just going to start a timer here. Um, but I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, so I prepared um, a little bit of a PowerPoint and um, let me see here. There we go. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm an associate professor at uh, the UNM Gallup campus in the nursing department. And I've been doing some um, teaching innovations and trying to incorporate um, native culture, uh, especially Diné culture, because we're bordered by uh, the Navajo reservation and also Zuni Pueblo reservation um, here in Gallup. And so I've been um, tweaking or revising some of the case studies I use to teach uh, nursing students. Uh, I teach level one uh, nursing students. So it's their first semester in our program. And we have associate uh, degree students and also baccalaureate um, degree students as well. <clears throat> and so I have um, just a brief review of the literature. Um, we know that um, there's going to be increased diversity in, um, in our country as we move forward in time. And so it's important that our um, instruction reflects um, culture, reflects um, what that looks like in our classrooms. So um, I've been trying to do that for the past two semesters, and it's been a, kind of a slow process just because it takes time to um, for me to to review the case studies and incorporate um, my two cents into the case studies. Um, I I've been working as a nurse for um, uh, over twenty years, and so it, and living here in New Mexico since twenty eighteen, and I worked at Crown Point IHS as a nurse practitioner. Um, for four and a half years, and now I work here in the clinic in Gallup. So I see a lot of um, um, differences in how we treat patients, especially in New Mexico. Um, we're a rural um, a state. Um, at the same time, we're also urban in Albuquerque. So it's important that our, um, our teachings reflect that. <laughs> And so I use the concept of nutrition um, and a case study related to nutrition. And I'll show you how that looks like. Uh, we uh, follow a concept-based curriculum here at UNM Gallup. And, um, and so that means we teach, um, we focus on a concept and, and the concept we can um, share information that can be applied widely through certain disease processes that we, um, um, we teach students. And here is a case study from a snippet from one of our texts, uh, our Yoast texts that we use. And it's it's generalized um, a case study focused on diabetes and also focused on um, nutrition. And I won't go through the details because of our time, but um, you can always go back and pause it and look at the information, but I'll move forward just to show how I um, uh, alter the case study. <clears throat> So um, in altering it, I try to first make sure that the names um, you know, can be consistent with what um, we see here in Navajo Reservation. I change it to a, a Navajo last name. Um, I change the clinic instead of a generalized emergency department. Um, I choose a local uh, tribal IHS Indian Health Center um, emergency department. I also um, revise the history of the patient. Um, I included um, um, some of the disease processes um, I see here um, in clinic. Um, so uncontrolled asthma. I kept the uh, hypertension, the cholesterol, high cholesterol with this patient, um, but also included um, COVID because COVID really hit uh, Navajo Nation um, really bad. Um, and so I wanted to include that because I see a lot of patients who have had COVID in the past come into clinic. Mm -hmm. And then um, adding the uncontrolled asthma, I had to add um, some asthma medication to her medication list. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is just generalized uh, initial assessment information. 
and I I did tweak this um to to um make it uh, more reflective of um the case study if it's since it's focused on diabetes I increased the weight of the patient uh, increase her respirations and also hypertension I uh, um, raise up the blood pressure. Um, sometimes patients might not be compliant with medication or it might be hard to access medication. Um, if especially if you're living in a rural area, it might be hard to um, go to the clinic because you might not have a ride or there's no transportation available. Uh, Navajo Nation does have a bus system, but sometimes it can be hard to time it just right. And sometimes people miss the bus. So um, that's that can be an issue. Okay. And here I changed um, here at the bottom. Um, when this patient ends up uh, being discharged, um, I put here that she'll see her primary care provider. Because um, uh, in IHS, we have not only physicians, but also nurse practitioners who um, provide care. and. Um, and also, I wanted to um, add in that because she had a history of COVID, that there might be some um, abnormal chest x-ray um, uh, results, so scarring of the lungs, lung tissue. And um, for the last piece of the case study, um, I added that uh, she is being admitted to the hospital <clears throat> as a newly di uh, diagnosed diabetic, um, but I also added here that her... Um, she has a family history of um, diabetes, uh, or sorry, of heart disease um, from her grandma, um, and they died from uh, complications of diabetes. Um, and that she does live in an area where there's no electricity or running water, because that can be um, a reality for some of our, our patients. So that makes it difficult when, um, um, when treating, especially like diabetes, um, sometimes patients take insulin and insulin has to be refrigerated. And if you don't have electricity, that can be a really challenging issue, especially in the summertime. So fortunately, um, uh, our pharmacists are really good. They have um, insulin that's shelf stable at 28 days. Um, so then patients can get like a 30 day supply of medication insulin uh, for their diabetes without having to refrigerate it. And um, I didn't change any of the questions. These were the questions from the textbook regarding the case study, um, uh, but um, I might tweak them in the future um, just to make sure it's uh, more culturally relevant. Um, and then also um, adapting it um, in terms of referring patients to um, treatment uh, for diabetes. We wanna monitor their A1C, but there's also what um, what I found was my native plate. So there's, um, and I'll, I'll come back to this slide. There's my plate, which a lot of people are familiar with, but there's also now, which they publish, oops, my native plate, which has more indigenous um, foods that, um, that uh, people might have access to. Um, so like deer meat, uh, turkey, wild rice, um, spinach, we have squash. Um, so it's more, um, more uh, native foods from the Americas um, that are represented there. And then there's also the special diabetes uh, program that uh, IHS has, um, which includes a diabetic nurse educator, a nutritionist, and they meet one-to-one -one with patients or in a group. And they have all these great services that sometimes um, other um, uh, non-IHS facilities might not have available. So I just wanted to include that. I think I'm at um, seven minutes. So I'll go ahead and uh, and I have my references. Um, I'll go ahead and entertain questions. And again, I just want to let you know, this was um, an innovative teaching practice rather than uh, research. But in the future, I'd love to do research on this um, and share that information with you guys. And I'll look in the chat. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you and might want to maybe unshare slides unless you need to show a particular slide. Oh, yeah. It's a little easier to pick out um, hands that are up. And and folks, go ahead and and um, either have your camera on and 
raise your hand or or use the reaction thing to raise a hand. Julia So has her hand up. Julia, go ahead. Yeah, um, I love the indigenous plate. It is just so, yes, touching my heart. Thank you for that. Okay. I'm just curious, um, are you part of the ECHO project? I, I know the ECHO project and I have uh, been invited to it, but just finding the time to jump okay. in. But yes, I, I plan on being uh, joining the ECHO project. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The, the ECHO project, I believe it's for rural health and yes. it involves uh, practitioners, providers in New Mexico mm -hmm. and sharing um, information, unique information that's um, health information unique to our state. And it's a it's a great um, project and program. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I see, um, I think Mr. Todd Quinn um, had a question. Have your students responded well to these changes? Absolutely, Todd. Um, a lot of students um, have mimicked um, their um, under, more understanding of the health, um, uh, the case studies. For example, when I do a case study on um, asthma and oxygenation, and we talk about um, wood burning stoves, um, and that you know um, that can affect someone's sleep because you have to put wood. Uh, during in the middle of the night, it might only last four to five hours. And so you only get a little bit of sleep. Then you have to put more wood in the stove uh, as opposed to coal, but coal will last longer, but it's not good for the lungs. And so we see a lot of people with um, uncontrolled asthma, respiratory issues, which is not good. So um, a lot of students can relate to that. And they perk up when they, uh, um, they participate in these case studies because it relates to, you know, what they grew up with. So, any other questions? Oh, thank you, Miss Mary said, it's great to see this. Uh, and thank, yes, thank you for your comment. Oh, thank you, for, uh, Mr. Uh, Walker, he says, um, you made the verb indigenize in the medical curriculum part of your students um, teaching, yes. And it, yeah, it is a very powerful term. Need any other questions? Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for um for listening to me and hearing me. And um, I guess we'll go to the next um next presenter. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, Julia So is up next. Uh, she's on the faculty at UNM Valencia in sociology. Julia, over to you. Julia, you're muted. Muted. Because I don't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Before I start, I would like to say my thanks to Associate Provost uh, Bill Stanley for inviting me to participate, but I also want to thank Hannah and Kate for organizing the logistics. So um, on this, with this, uh, let me see here. Study, what I want to do, close your eyes first. Let me give you some background here. Uh, this is a seven year data of face-to-face -face long semesters intro to sociology class starting from fall 2012 to fall of 2019. So we all know what happened to spring 2020. That's why it's not part of it. So I'm going to show you the results first. First the completion rate and then the success rate. And then I will tell you what I have done over the seven years. And then I will share with you my opinion about my study, the weakness and the strength of it. So here you will see um, the blue chart, the blue bars, they represent uh, Hispanic male, orange bars are the Hispanic females, and the gray lines are the outcome of everybody else except the Hispanic students that we have. So you can tell that, let me minimize this because um, overall looks like completion rate, they finished the semester, but didn't say much, right? But the next 
chart is a little bit more interesting is their success rate. So as you can tell, 2012 was kind of very discouraging for me. That was my first semester at UDM Valencia. And the success rate is not even 60%. Latino males is barely 50%. So it's really a, a learning moment for me. What did I do wrong? What have I not done? It was clear to me that I would not I would not, should not teach the way I taught before you're in Valencia. So it's like a lot of soul searching during that year. But as you see, um, the outcome is a little bit better. Now I want to address the big deep here. This is other students. I went back to look at the data. Now the data, ad hoc data from our IR person at Valencia. So here I have 23 out of 56 students that failed the class. That's why I have a big dip here. But also here in 2018, I have four out of the seven Latino males that failed the class. But 19 of the 19 Latinas, they all passed with a grade of C or better. So that is comforting to know. I'm sure all of you realize that uh, in general, female students do perform better than male in general. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. So over the seven years, this is what I have learned. Um, I learned that teaching is a humbling journey. I have to keep learning. Uh, I have to change my mindset, um, really focusing on what I can do to help students learn. I needed to constantly self-reflect what I did right, what I didn't write, did, did not do anything correctly because considering the population of Valencia is very, very different from the urban students that I used to have when I was in Texas. And then of course, um, my role as an instructor is to facilitate the learning. They are the one that has to learn, not me here. So um, I started doing a lot of uh, surveys. I'm a sociologist, so everything I want to know I just throw out a survey to them. So, and I started treating my teaching as a scholarship of teaching and learning. So that was the, really the high point of my seven years journey. In terms of mentoring, I designed a student intake form. I asked students to meet with me one-on-one -on -one at the beginning of the semester. So we get to know each other better. I created a course map for them to know what they need to do but also to let them know that how I'm going to assess them. This is the course map is a very essential tool for them to be successful. So this is part of my uh, student intake form. If any one of you feel like you want a copy, I'll be happy to share. So moving on the course map, it really connects the course, the unit, the module, learning maturity. Stephanie is here. I'm sure you know that all these are all required by QM. And it really helps me uh, to become a more effective instructor. So at the end, I actually have evidence to show that students actually learn what they learn and what they did not learn here. So uh, in terms of mentoring, I every now and then remind students about their financial aid eligibility because over half of the student bodies of Valencia, they are on financial aid. So this is a gentle reminder, make sure you pass this class, otherwise you will lose your eligibility. At the beginning of class period, I always play music, sort of like calm them down, and I make sure they work in groups. I ask them to do things right and share instead of jumping in to talk right away, because some of the students, they are just thinkers. Thinkers do not talk right away, because I am a thinker, so I can relate to them. I break down the lecture into chunks, and then I make sure that I have a one minute paper. Formative assessment helps me to know whether that class was successful or not. And I make sure that I use every strategy I can have to pull the student out. And as the only Asian American faculty on campus, I knew I look differently, I speak differently, I speak with an accent, which is perfectly fine. But for some reason, over the years, um, I just have a feeling that student is very 
it's very difficult for students to accept someone who speaks differently from them. So I just have to make sure that I want them to see me as a human being rather than someone that looked differently from her. So I just do everything what the books tell me not to do. I don't label them. I follow the principle of UDL. I put them into teams and work. Yeah, I have them write uh, reflective learning essays. And I speak with those students who are quiet, um, trying to just make the connections with them. So they feel like uh, the instructor cares for them. As we all know, students don't care much about how much we know until they know we care. So those are my strategies. In terms of monitoring, the formative assessment is one way, but I also monitor, um, help them to connect between classes. So with the team activity sheets, at the end of the class, they have to write down what they learned, what did they did not understand. So that's the time when I email the answer to them. In the meantime, I also assign a short article, some video for them to watch so we can they can come back and then we can discuss. So it's really connecting two class periods. Yeah. More importantly, I also monitor their attendance. Uh, I give them two free passes with no question asked. They can miss two classes. I don't even need to know why. But if they miss a class, I send them an email, ask them, hey, what's going on? We miss you. They miss two, I send them another email, but it's when they do not respond to me, that's when I put out an early alert report. It gets serious now and have advisor to start speaking with them. So um, this, is, this is a fine line to walk. Um, monitoring the attendance, but we all know that students who attend classes they fare better than those who miss classes, yeah. So <laughs> test anxiety, we all have test anxieties, particularly for students at Valencia. So we talk about that. I gave them some tools, all these are really evidence-based strategies to help them reduce the test anxiety. And I tell them that if you have a security blanket, a doll, whatever you need to calm you down, bring it because I just want them to calm down. When we are calm down, we are really better in terms of taking the exam because many times we just draw a blank. We knew we knew it, but it's like, what is it? We couldn't think of it because our physiology just affect our thinking. So um, <clears throat> when students that fail, I ask them to come to my office and then we go for the exam together. I want to look at the class notes and their study notes, tell them the difference between the two, because I really need to know how they study. And I also shared a copy of the best answer to the essay question. So my essays has two, my exams have two part, an essay part and a multiple choice part. Personally, I do not like multiple choice, but I do it just because students are so used to it. Yeah, so those are really part of monitoring. Now, um, in my opinion, a midterm feedback is too late. I have done it at six week point. It's early enough for me to catch what's not going well and help students to adjust. And I myself can adjust too. Although I do tell them that there are certain non-negotiables certain thing I can adjust, but others I really absolutely cannot. So it really helped me to sort of like nip the bud when it first came out and help students to success. So this is my uh, six week feedback, sort of like giving me a, a feel of the class, how it goes. And if students say, I don't like to watch videos or students like to have, have more videos and I'll show more as long as it's connected to the class materials. So those will help me to be a little bit more effective instructors. At the end of the semester, I know institution has uh, its own, I have my own too, but this is really for me to tweak the course, to tweak the delivery and just making sure that I teach to my students because Valencia students are just not the same as others. I need to hear from the students. 
So number eight is very interesting. What is one thing you wish you could have happened in this class? And this many times it gave me some very interesting answers. But here are some samples here. Students love the one-on-one -on -one conference. They love the personal meeting after the first exam. Uh, they love the music. They love the team exam. They love the workbook. Um, I published a workbook for them to take notes and it has been very, very helpful to them. So these are really uh, things that I have continued to do today and um, over the years. Now, the weakness of this, because I didn't really plan it this way, my focus was like, what can I do to make sure students pass this course to help them follow the path? I don't give the grade to them, they earn the grade. So another weakness is really, uh, I did not focus on the Latino students. Maybe I can do it another time. Uh, I do not compare uh, Latino students with the general population. Now, most importantly, I think this is, um, I lamented this is because I am unable to identify certain independent variable that is the significance. That I can forget about all this and just do this and help students. But over the seven years, I'm convinced that I have to do all this. Yes, it's just a lot of work, but I'm proud of doing what I did. What happened now is because of COVID, the COVID generation is so different. I feel like I need to relearn about my students. Come fall, the entry students to UNM will be the first group of high students, high school students that did not experience high school campus life. And they're coming to us. What are we doing for them? That's the big question in my, in my head. And what I plan to do is really on the first day of class, spend 15 minutes and just share. share. Uh, let them voice how they feel. Even though it's four years ago, it's still fresh in their mind. Yeah. So that is that is the plan. And then probably compare the Latinos, other males online with face to face. All these wonderful things if I have a time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. We'll do the same thing. Uh, raise hands if you've got a question. Uh, Mary Wilms, go ahead. Apologies, I, I hit my raise hand <laughs> when I meant to applaud, so apologies. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Bill, you have your hands up? Oh, do I? <laughs> uh, no, Billy Brown. Oh, it's a, oh, Billy it's Brown. A yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I, I will ask a question if there isn't another one immediately, uh, which is, can you say a little bit more about what you do with the intake form? I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, and sort of yeah. how do you then, what do you do with the input that you get? Uh, let me put it out and show you. This is just part of the intake form. So I asked students, essentially, you can read the screen, right? Yeah. So question five is a lot of background information. Uh, I want to uh, identify certain non-academic barriers. Like for example, question six, the mode of transportation. Um, it came out from one, um, one semester, a student asked me that, can she leave early? And she says she has to take the real bus. If she missed that, she has to wait an hour and a half for the other bus. So I said, Laura, sure. I'm sorry, I don't think we can see the form. This is Laura. Oh, you know what? La culpa mia. I didn't share. <laughs> okay. Minnesota has her hand up, but she's next. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, okay. So number five are really uh, background information. That's when I find out students, many of them work 30, 40 hours a week and they're on financial aid. It's like, wow, according to our registrar, this information is not captured anywhere. 
So a couple of years ago, I spoke with our uh, campus registrar and I say, I have those data if you want, because I keep them all these years. Um, I think it's very useful if we really want to tease out why certain students are not doing well, see this is enroll 12 hours or more. Uh, question six asks about the transportation to campus. And this will impact their attendance. I One semester as a student sent me an email, I don't have money to buy gas. I cannot come to class. It just broke my heart when I hear read this. I mean, what can we do as an instructor? Um, trust me, for years, I've been learning detachment, and I still have a hard time detaching. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you did, yeah. Um, thank you. And then uh, Dr. Zarai has her hand up. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, what do you feel is the most surprising lesson uh, that you've learned in all of your years of teaching? Seven years. Okay, it's just a 12 years at Valencia now. Um, to be honest, <sighs> I think in part it's because I'm the only Asian American faculty member on campus. Um, I really feel very isolated, mm -hmm. to be very, very honest. I have to make extra efforts to connect to other faculty with other faculty members as well as students. In fact, I just felt like it might be easy for me to connect with students because I see them twice a week. Faculty members, we just became hallway faculty, say hi and bye. Yeah. Um, we talk about belonging, a sense of belonging for our students. I think uh, personally, I think we have to start with faculty members and staff. Yeah. But that's my two, two things. You, you, you hit my heart right here, Dr. Sarai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense um, if faculty members can't connect to one another when they have, you know, so much in common, actually, how effective can they be in connecting with students um, mm -hmm. from backgrounds like ours? So I, I think that is really an important thing to say. Um, I remember I was watching The Office and I was like, wow, these people all get along. And you know, like I couldn't imagine a work environment like that because for me, academia has never been that so collegial, you know, in um, academic departments. And so, yeah, it just, it, it gives us something to strive for to create that sense of belongingness and inclusion um, everywhere we are because then that spills over into the classroom. So thank you so much. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I survived 12 years, folks. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and, and the responses to the questions. Much appreciated. Um, next up is Carrie Stevenson. Uh, she's on the faculty in English at, at UNM Gallup, um, presenting on For the Birds. Carrie. All right, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. I think um, everybody can see that. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's good. All right. Um, so this is titled For the Birds, uh, Reading Avian-Centered Texts as Evidence of Multispecies Community. And uh, my research tends to focus on animal studies, um, which is a multidisciplinary field uh, that looks at representations of animals in all kinds of media, as well as actual relationships that humans have um, with uh, animals in uh, the real space, and especially um, the idea of entanglement, uh, which was popularized by Anna Singh in her book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, looking at um, various human communities that include uh, Matsutake mushrooms, a very uh, precious kind of mushroom that uh, sells for high prices in Japan. Um, and she defines entanglement as a mosaic of open-ended assemblages of entangled ways of life with each further opening into a mosaic of temporal rhythms and spatial arcs. Uh, humans are entangled with everything from invasive species to viruses to the bacteria in our guts uh, to pets, uh, all of these different communities that we can't really separate ourselves from. 
Um, and I think that uh, looking at literature can really be a way of throwing a light on these kinds of entanglements that don't necessarily show up so brightly um, in just day-to-day -day life uh, with other species. And uh, I focused on uh, my research and writing on memoirs centered around birds uh, because there's been a lot more study done of companion animals like dogs um, and cats and in general other mammals uh, than there has been with birds. Um, like dog memoirs um, like Marley and Me tend to be bestsellers, you know, because we know the story. Uh, the puppy gets adopted, you know, shows the training and the love and the loyalty to the family. And then uh, the memoir ends with the animal's death. Um, and uh, nature writer Lyanda Lynn Hopp says, whenever an animal has a book written about it, that animal ends up dead <laughs> uh, at the end. Um, and uh, I think that this is because the ending of the story is actually comforting to the audience. Uh, you know, the, we have the sadness, the reminder that we enjoyed the animal's company. And I would argue it's actually kind of a confirmation of human superiority <laughs> that our lives continue and the animal's life ends. Um, they die, we go on. Uh, and really, this is a story that's written large all across the globe. You know, you can see it in the loss of biodiversity, the extinction of endangered species, um, the animal victims of climate change. Uh, and we have these relationships that I don't know if I would say they're all patterned on this loss of the beloved dog, but they're pretty similar. And I don't think we necessarily like that story, but we're very attached to it. We're used to it. Uh, and that's not the kind of story that tends to show up in avian-centered memoirs. Uh, this is the cover and a photograph of Joanna Berger, um, who's an ornithologist, uh, scientist, and uh, the writer of the memoir, The Parrot Who Owns Me, The Story of a Relationship. Um, she talks about how uh, Tico, her Red Lord Amazon, actually outlived his two previous owners. Um, one of them died and one of them had to enter assisted living that didn't allow pets. Uh, and when her story starts, Tico is actually 35 years old, which is middle age uh, for her. Uh, his species. And uh, she begins the story by saying, my parrot Tico didn't court me until five years into our relationship. So it actually took a long time for him to really warm up to her and uh, bond to her. Uh, so it's a very different kind of story um, than the ones that we're used to um, with these dog memoirs or these ideas that the animal will die and the human will continue on. Um, and it's more like uh, in, in many a race, you know, nature of a relationship with a parrot. Um, Tico doesn't die at the end of the book either. <laughs> he keeps living uh, and uh, goes beyond uh, the end of that book. So this is more like uh, the relationship with Tico draws Berger and her audience into this middle of a multi-species community um, that shows a lot of the similarities between humans and parrots. Uh, parrots live decades. Um, they can live up to 90 years in some species. Uh, they lead socially complex lives in the wild, and they bond with individual humans and other birds as mates. Uh, they don't have the pack mate kind of um, following that we're familiar with with dogs. So we break down uh, the human equal leader, animal equal loyal follower um, kind of relationship that we tend to assume will pertain with companion animals and even sometimes with other kinds of animals, the way that they tend to get written about. Uh, but it's really closer. Um, the science uh, backs Berger up more than it does that kind of just, this is the way uh, all animals are. Um, for example, there's a book called The Parrot in the Mirror that was published in 2022 by Antoine Martino Triswell. Uh, and he argues, um, quote, that even beyond the parrots, we humans can find great similarities with many birds that we do not share with other mammals. Indeed, we are positively bird-like. Uh, and that may not sound like it's true at first, <laughs> but uh, humans' intelligence, our verbal communication skills, uh, reliance on our visual sense, the fact that we're active during the day, unlike a lot of mammals, um, and even our sense of beauty, um, echo birds. Uh, pigeons were actually taught to distinguish between the paintings of Monet and Manet, uh, and they learned to do that faster than the college students who were being taught at the same time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that's not something I think that a whole lot of people know. Like, we're used to thinking of pigeons as these annoying, disease-ridden, ugly birds that <laughs> uh, share the city with us, and we really wish they would go away. Um, so, 
Uh, but instead, we're part of this community of beauty, um, the ability to distinguish art and uh, in some birds uh, that, for example, uh, smash berries to paint the walls of the bowers that they create um, to court their mates. You know, we have this ability to create beauty um, that makes us part of this community um, with birds. So um, these avian centered memoirs have the ability to kind of turn this idea, this common or cute animal story upside down. You know, the, the pigeon is a common bird, but a lot of people don't think it's a very cute one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this carries us beyond the species borders um, with pigeons, with parrots. Um, even if it's just for a moment, uh, this kind of shock of surprise disrupts that familiar story. Um, and it takes evolutionary relationships into consideration, but it also confounds those evolutionary relationships because we're not as closely related to birds uh, as we are to other mammals, even though we're very like them. Um, so yeah, we're entangled with these birds and other beings in ways that are just impossible to unravel and that you know can exhibit wonder and delight instead of just the despair that, oh, another species went extinct, oh no. Uh, you know, which is the way that I think a lot of people tend to regard it. Um, and I did want to mention uh, one more particular uh, multi-species community that shows up in uh, some uh, subgenres of bird-centered memoirs, and that's falconry, the art of hunting with hawks. Um, and this is the cover of The Taming of Genghis by Ronald Stevens, who was a mid-20th century Irish falconer. Uh, and he says when he's discussing um, the relationship he has with Genghis, it is written that man shall have dominion over the fowls of the air, but Genghis is not of the kind that suffer dominion. I asked for partnership. How generously this Lord of the air gave me his share of it can be appreciated from the story that follows. Uh, and um, he says Genghis cannot be a servant. He will not be a pet. Uh, Stevens actually says in his memoir that hawks that are kept as pets are not good hunters. And so they can't establish a true partnership um, with a human. Um, so this is a different kind of relationship with a hawk that relies on trust and courtesy. Um, Stephen Bodio, who wrote uh, the memoir, Rage for Falcons, um, actually notes that, quote, the education of the falconer is a chastening process during which you learn to be polite to an animal. Uh, and I don't think many people would assume that that's the case, but uh, falconers mark themselves off deliberately as like mad and obsessive and they're proud of it. And you can see that from the titles of the memoirs that I have on display here, <laughs> you know, a rage for falcons and falcon fever. Um, so this is seen as an equal partnership or in fact, one where the falconer is a junior partner um, instead of the dominant uh, figure that we tend to assume um, happens. Uh, well, I would say pretty much all relationships with animals, but especially with dogs. Um, so you've got this shock of the new, this leap of surprise, you know, um, to get out of this common mode of thinking of animals um, as beloved inferiors who teach us these well-worn lessons that, oh yeah, I know that lesson, but I'm going to hear or read about it again. Um, so the end of a falconry tale is actually um, more, more often the escape of the bird. The bird just leaves uh, because it can survive in the wild. Um, but other memoirs like The Parrot Who Owns Me and uh, Helen McDonald's The H, H is for Hawk, which uh, won a lot of awards, and with the bird still alive and keeping companionship with the human. Um, and as you can see here in this image of a falcon with her partner, uh, you have to have a lot of trust. Like it, it takes a lot of trust to stand there while this big bird flies at you, <laughs> uh, to have this glove on your hand that you have to use to handle the hawk because otherwise its talons just go through your hand. Um, so I think avian centered texts offer us a new way of thinking about multi-species community, um, this entanglement with winged things uh, that sets us free of a stale mindset. Uh, regarding other beings. And there's a nature writer called Cy Montgomery who's written a lot about all kinds of animals, but also birds. And uh, she says to be part of this partnership with birds is it opens up the sky uh, and gives you basically a new kind of way um, to share and to love. And there's my word said it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Wow, that blew my mind. Uh... <laughs> 
I think we have time for one at most two questions. So uh, Julius, first up, go ahead. Um, do you have a movie to recommend in terms of birds? I watch my teacher, The Octopus. I just love that movie of daily. So if you have one for birds, I would love to watch it. <laughs> Uh, I actually don't because I focus so much on texts. I have a visual impairment that makes it very hard for me to watch, but I would say there is a documentary that was aired on PBS in, I want to say 2012, but it may be older than that. Um, and uh, it's, now I'm running out of the title. It's about parrots and why they don't make good pets, basically. And I believe it might be called of parrots and people. Uh, there's a book by that title that I think the documentary was based on. And uh, that includes, for example, a woman who says, people want a parrot that is quiet, that talks, and that doesn't bite. And that species has not yet been discovered. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the, the realities of living with birds are, are just so different from what people expect. And I would actually recommend that nobody get a bird unless, you know, you're rescuing it from uh, in really undesirable environment and you're up for that commitment. Um, I live with a parrot who I took in because he was my aunt and she died very suddenly of a heart attack. And uh, unless you're prepared for that, really don't do it. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank uh, you so much for that, for that, uh, that presentation. Um, Next up is Peter Walker, who's on the faculty in Film and Digital Media Arts at UNM Taos. Peter, over to you. You did. Okay. There we go. All right. Let me get this where to go. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, before I before I begin, I just wanted to thank uh, the team that makes all of our jobs and work possible, which would be our chancellor, UNM Taos, Dr. Mary Gutierrez, our Dean of Academic Affairs, Dr. Randy Archuleta, Sarah Stoller is the Department Chair of Fine Arts and Film and Digital Media, and then also, of course, the entire UNM staff and faculty here in Taos who really uh, work together to make all of our departments work. And then, of course, we're part of the main campus, uh, which we feel the support, and that's how we thrive as our branch campuses. So. It takes a team, and especially uh, in the age of AI, we need each other, you know, to navigate these these wild waters. Because sometimes AI is a little impersonal, and a little kind of digital and computer. And so I think uh, it's more important than ever um, to to have people around us that you know we can work together and face some of these challenges together. So I wanted to um, give that shout out. Um, so yeah, my name is Peter. Um, yeah, full-time faculty member, uh, run the Film and Media Arts Program, and my presentation is Making Media in the Age of AI, and my little sub-theme is Distractions and Opportunities. So as artists, we make media, that's what we do. Uh, singers sing, writers write, filmmakers tell visual stories, publishers are the ones who take the content from the artists and get it out to the world. Everyone has a different reason for doing what they do and the, their specific form of media. For example, sometimes we take a photograph and we print it as a frameable gift because we want to share something we perceive as beautiful with other people. And other times we make art for money. For example, I know a master theater director in Malaysia who gets paid $20,000 for a weekend of directing Pampers commercials. And that's how he funds what he loves, which is the theater. And so all media conveys a message and it might be a message of love, it might be a message of, or it might be a message of persuasion to buy a certain brand of diapers. And today we're making media in the age of AI. So it's kind of a game changer. Profound changes are underway and each and every one of us will have to decide what is a distraction, what's an opportunity. So I have a couple of things I'd like to share with you. And the first clip is some of the AI innovations that are happening all around us. So let me share my screen and see if I can do that. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Oh wait, what's this? Ah. Oh. Okay. Please install the monitor device. Oh, to share the computer audio. Okay, that's too bad. All right. So let's actually. Whoops. Let me just get back in here. What happened there? Oh wait. So you've got like a, what it looks like a video frame up. 
Okay, so actually, it might not do the audio, which is fine, but you can watch what's happening and I'll, I'll kind of uh, see it. Oh, wait, now there we go. Okay, we're switching. Okay, here we go. So it may not play the audio, but that's okay. AI has a lot of impressive new tricks, videos like these are going viral. People are playing the basses, crowds are morphing to cats, dances are getting colorful, statues are dancing, sports videos are taking on new life. And cosplay is joining anime. <laughs> I love this. And look at this brilliant creative idea. It is a great transition. People are starting to create stories with AI videos. This AI can replace actors with CG characters. It also does the lighting, camera, motion, and captures the active spaces. Another AI can take sketches and render them based on your description. Imagine how it... Okay, so I'll stop it there. And I don't know if you could hear that narration, but he's basically just describing what you're watching. So, uh, you know, the back to my sub theme, which is distractions or opportunities. That's kind of for everyone to decide. Some of the stuff is so wild. And, you know, we have so many tools at our fingertips. Um, and one of the one of the things that some AI experts say is that AI won't take your job. And this is what I, you know, tell my young media makers who are coming through our program and want to have a career in media making. AI won't take your job, but someone who can use AI tools will do the job of 10 people. So with that in mind, we're attempting to integrate AI innovations and tools into our projects here at UNM Taos by uh, combining live action with animation and then also motion capture technology, which has some AI elements built into it. So I would like to share another um, project here. Let me pull that up. And hold on. All right, so it's full screen. Okay, can you hear me still? Okay, cool. All right, so this is a um, this is a uh, a project with the BLM. It's called the Adventure Safety Series. The target audience for this video series is uh, international visitors who are planning on coming to the Rio Grande del Norte Monument. Uh, and they need to know how to stay alive and stay safe in our regular environment and also respect the culture that we have. So it's a multi-year project and it's created by our faculty and advanced students collaborating with the BLM and the Public Lands Interpretive Association. So this first episode, which I'll scroll through, uh, is a river safety. We just got off the river. We went down the river with a law enforcement officer and he talked about the importance of wearing a life jacket. Yeah, and you get in the car, hopefully you don't think about putting on your seatbelt. Yeah, I'm gonna mute that. And so then in comes our animated characters. So what we did was uh, we want to have these animated characters to our two tourists, Joey and his dad, and they did not get the memo about any of the safety gear. They have no shoes on, no sunscreen, no hats, no life jackets. And the dad has a cooler of beer. And this is kind of the old school way to do it. Um, and we shoot the scenes and then we work with our animator, who's one of our alumni, to animate these characters going down the river. And you can see what happens when you're not prepared, little Joey. We're just getting a static. I'm just seeing a static uh, Vimeo okay. frame. Yeah. It's not moving. OK. That's a problem with doing video for these presentations. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So I will go to a freeze frame. So here is a. Uh, Got it. Yeah, we yep. weren't even seeing this. I mean, you just switched okay. to it. Yeah. Video. yeah. Yeah. See, that's the problem with trying to play video. I'm going to switch over here real quick. I'll give you the freeze frames real quick here. Okay, so we we did another episode. The first one was the river, them going down, uh, animation on live action. And then we... Joey goes to another part of the wild and scenic and he ends up flying his drone, which is, it's illegal, but more than illegal, it's just, it'll just, it'll disrupt the raptor nesting because if you fly a drone down there, it'll disrupt the, the chicklets and then the mother eagle will abandon the nest and then abandon the chicks. And so the way, the way this is connected to AI is, is our storytelling of, um, one thing is it's using our students, their talent and their their love of animation and, you know, anything um, with AI, which basically to make these characters, let me get a good screenshot here since the video is not playing. 
okay, there, there's our chicklets. So these are animated chicklets as well. And so what we do is we go film the scenes, give, give the templates, and then they get filled in with these animated characters. It's a lot of back and forth and a lot of collaborative work, but it, it kind of creates a fun way to tell a story. And now we're able to get these characters animated with Blender rigged up, You should, I could say. For example, there's Joey with his binoculars. We have him go back and show what to do with binoculars in a camera rather than a drone. And now once this was all done um, with frame by frame animation, but now with the motion capture suit, you put it on. And once the characters are rigged up, you, you can move them any way you want. And so the animation is much quicker and much smoother. And the idea is that students see other students working on this kind of thing, and they're able to integrate the AI into really valuable storytelling that hopefully tells the story in a, in a unique way. So that is, um, is what we're working on. And let's see, I think I'm getting to the end here. Yeah, so basically in the age of AI, you know, we're looking for, for opportunities to engage uh, with dynamic storytelling possibilities. And if, a you know, if, if that's true, that AI won't take your job, but someone who can use AI tools will do the job of 10 people, we want our students to be those people that can use it and then be able to do more and have better art and, and quicker too. That's the thing. Everything's going to speed up because you're expected now to do 10 times the work, practically 10 times faster. And so we are integrating it as, as fast as we can so that we can use those tools but like I said kind of earlier is that I counterbalance by going on these trips to these really cool locations with a team, having lunch together, working as a team, you know, doing the, the safety talks. And so that people feel part of a team as we're integrating AI so that we're not just, uh, you know, working for the machine, but rather we're using the machine, the AI to help us tell stories that have an impact. Um, yeah, and have some fun along the way. So that's it. And uh, I will put our website into the chat, which has all of these projects. And I, it's the video does not share good on Vimeo. I just or on uh, on um, on Zoom. So I apologize for that. But you can take a look at our website and, and watch it all. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, Hannah's going to grab a list of the participants. And, and if you want to send if you send a link to anything oh, cool. you'd like us to be able to view afterwards, we can we can forward that to people who were who I would love today. to do that. Yeah, a lot of uh, this is all on our website and and the the whole six part episode will be released uh, this summer. So you'll be able to see all the finished episodes that we've been working on. It's been almost a four year project. And I will stop my share. Okay, thanks. Any questions for Peter? A lot of applause. I did have a question. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the way I tend to hear AI talked about is doom, gloom, despair. We're all going to be homeless in two years. Yeah. So I was just wondering, um, how do you counter that? Or do you not really run into that much in your field? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's everywhere. It's pervasive. Um, we can't ignore it. You know, I teach film digital media arts. We're we're feeding into the film industry. Everybody, every single program in New Mexico is thinking about it, using it. You know, Netflix, everybody, everybody is utilizing it. And so uh you know, if we can use it for for to help us do what we gotta do, that's fantastic. Um, but it's still about what story are we trying to tell? Are we telling, you know, AI stories? This back to the distractions and opportunities. There's a lot of distractions. I definitely have stayed up all night playing with the newest app that does amazing things. Like anyone in here made an avatar themselves. It's amazing. And then, you know, you're like, well, for what? Okay. Maybe I just wasted a whole night, but that was fun, but I'm not going to do it again. Then it's like, well, how can I use AI to help me tell my story? So for example, these motion capture things, we're using it to tell the story about our Rio Grande del Norte monument that international visitors can benefit from. So for me, that's what I'm trying to drive everything towards and give our students those skills so that they can use it uh, and get those jobs. Um, it's a tough one and it's, it's, it's not going away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank our presenters. Those are great. Great presentations, and uh, as always, an amazing range of things that people are working on. 
um, throughout UNM. So congratulations on your work. Thank you for presenting. A thanks to our audience for being here today. Um, and I look forward to learning more about your future endeavors. So thanks very much. Thank you.